Welcome to my message today as I talk about fight for your faithfulness. Fight for your faithfulness. This is part of a series I'm uh, doing right now called The Fight. And, uh, and in this series, we're uh, focusing on the fact that, that, listen, life is a fight. But like the Apostle Paul, we want to fight a good fight. Fight. And our key verse for the series is 2 Timothy 4 7a, where the Apostle Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have fought the good fight. And it's really important to understand that life is a fight. Uh, we are going to have to fight uh, in this life. It's not going to be easy. We're going to face a, a, lot of, a lot of battles uh, in this life. But here's the deal Paul said at the end of his life, he fought a good fight. And so, listen, the idea here, the goal here is to fight a good fight. And to do that, you got to win battles that matter the most. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about winning the battle when it comes to being faithful to God. Today, we're going to talk about fight for your faithfulness, fight for your faithfulness. And, uh, and all of these battles we're talking about, uh, matter most because they relate directly to our potential uh, in life. If you don't win the battle of faithfulness to God, you're going to limit, listen, you're going to limit your potential in life. You're not going to be able to maximize uh, your life. And so I want to help you today from God's Word do just that. And today we're going to be studying Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, and we're going to cover all those verses, but right now I want to read what I call the key verse, which is Ephesians 6, uh, verse number 12. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly Places. So this is a powerful verse, and uh, it talks about the fact that we're involved in what's called spiritual warfare. And we're going to learn today that our enemy is Satan. He's our adversary. Uh, he's our opponent. And when we wrestle, and there's that key word when it comes to the idea of fighting. So we're looking in this series at six what I call fight passages. And this one talks about the sport of wrestling. The idea of battling when it comes to, 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 to wrestling. And, uh, and he's talking about the fact that our wrestling is not with flesh and blood. It's not with human people, but rather Satan. And listen, he is highly organized. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that when we get to that part of the, of the sermon today. But we're wrestling. We're wrestling to be faithful to God. So what is the number one enemy of faithfulness? I believe the number one enemy of faithfulness is inconsistency. Inconsistency. This is something we battle with. Uh, we battle with just simply being consistent uh, in our Christian life. And we get inconsistent, and what that is, that's unfaithfulness. And yet the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren... Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And here the Bible gives us a challenge. And it says, as a Christian, we're to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. We're, we're to be consistent. We're to be faithful uh, in the work of the Lord. Uh, the Lord. And, and so this is what God uh, desires. This is what God expects. But it's a battle, right? It, it's, it's not easy to do, to be consistent. And, uh, and I like to put it this way. The Christian life is a full-time lifestyle. The Christian life. How is the Christian life to be lived? Full-time for God. Always with God. All, always faithful to God. Always uh, loyal to God. Always serving God the Lord. And so there's going to be this battle, right, to be faithful to God. But we got to win that battle because if we don't, again, it's going to limit our, what, potential uh, in life. So how can we do that? Well, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 lays it out beautifully. 
as we talk about how to fight for your faithfulness, how to fight uh, for your faithfulness. And today we're going to look at six different uh, ways from this passage you can fight for your faithfulness. So are you ready to go? Let's dive in and let's look at what this awesome passage says about faithfulness. Number one, it says, rely on God's strength, not your own. Rely on God's strength, not your own. It's really important to understand you're never going to be faithful to God in your own strength. The Christian life was not ever designed to be lived naturally. It is a supernatural life, and we are very much in need of God to help us. And Paul says that in Ephesians 6, verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, and listen, in the power of His might. The challenge is to be strong in the Lord, but notice he doesn't say be strong in the Lord using your own strength. No, the Bible says in the power of His might. We, we are to rely on God. We're, we're to depend on God to help us, to help us. And there's an Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage I want to read that talks about that. In uh, Zechariah 4, 6, the book, book, you say, what is that? It's called Zechariah, the Bible book of Zechariah. And here it says, and so he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, okay, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. God says, hey, you're not going to cut it with your might and your power. You're going to have to rely on God's spirit. You're going to have to rely on God to help you. Don't try to live the Christian life by your own strength. Be like the Apostle Paul. Philippians 4.13 says, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. I can do all things. You know, if you just stop there, that's, that's humanism. You know, like I, you know, I can do all things. But we're not humanists, we're Christians. And a Christian says, I can do all things, but it's through Christ. And it's through Christ who strengthens me me. Today, go all in in your dependence on God. Recognize, you got to say, God, I want to be faithful to you. God, I need you to strengthen me. I need, I need you to help me. Ask God to provide you the strength and lean into God for that strength. Number two, know your enemy is the devil. Just, just, just realize it's spiritual warfare. We're, we're in a fight. And we have an enemy, and his name is the devil, or he's also called Satan. Uh, he's our opponent. Uh, he's our adversary. And the Bible puts it this way in Ephesians 6, 11 through 12, put on the whole armor of God, which we'll look at in the next point, that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the tricks or the techniques of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I mean, the Christian life, ladies and gentlemen, it's a battleground, not a playground. The Christian life is a battleground, not a playground. And, and, and the Bible makes it clear that, that we are to be able to stand against two, the devil, and specifically the tricks or the techniques, the wiles of the devil. And, and we need to understand that, you know, the devil has a, a team, okay, a team of demons, if you will. And, uh, and, and they're highly organized, okay? You know, Satan is a limited being. God, God is infinite. God is omnipresent. That means he is everywhere, the devil is not that way. The devil is finite. The devil can only be in one place at one time. And the truth is, most of us have never personally 
uh, I, I doubt encountered the devil. I'm not saying it, it could happen, and maybe it has, but, if, but he's probably messing with some people you know, that are you know, a little bit higher up on the, on the chain of influence, if you will, okay? Uh, but that doesn't mean anything, okay? He's got a whole host of, of demonic forces. And, and verse 12 just talks about how they're highly organized uh, to fight uh, against us. And, and the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9a, be sober, be vigilant. But be sober means not, not don't be drunk or whatever. It means be serious. S Satan is serious. Uh, be vigilant. It means stay busy for God because your adversary, again, that idea is opponent. Your enemy, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And here's what the Bible says. Resist him. Resist him how? Steadfast in the faith. Be steadfast in your faithfulness to God. Listen, understand you have an enemy. And th this is a big reason why it's hard to be faithful because of the spiritual warfare that goes on and the temptation that we face and the battle that we face uh, with the, uh, Satan and his demonic uh, forces. Just, just know it. We're, we're in a battle between right and wrong, between good and bad, between God and the devil. Don't let him win, okay? Be faithful. Resist him. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Number three, put on the armor of God. Put on the armor of God. So Ephesians 6.13 says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. So we already saw in verse 11, when we read that, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. That's verse 11. And now we come to verse 13, and it's repeated again. It says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So the Bible here uses this idea of the armor of God, the armor of God. And this is really uh, interesting, okay? And, and to really understand the idea here, you got to understand the context, the context. Where is Paul when he's writing this Bible book the, to the Ephesians? Where is he? Well, Paul was in a Roman prison cell when he wrote Ephesians. And listen, he was surrounded by Roman soldiers. This is really important because what he's going to describe as the armor of God, he's going to use the concept of a Roman soldier and their equipment, and he's going to talk about their different pieces of equipment, and then he's going to relate it to the Christian life, all right? And how we're to put on the armor of God. They're, 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 the, the Roman soldiers, they're putting on the armor of, of, of Caesar and, and, and of Rome, okay? Uh, but we're to put on the armor of, of God. Let me just read Acts 28, 16, which talks about where Paul is. It says, now when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself Listen to this, with the soldier who guarded him. So where is Paul? Paul, it says, is dwelling by himself with a soldier who guarded him. I mean, 24-7, Paul is under lockdown, and specifically, there's a Roman uh, soldier uh, guarding him. And many believe that to do that, you, they actually locked arms together. They were, they were literally chained uh, together, all right? But no matter what, he was right on the spot. He was right there. So Paul is constantly looking at this Roman soldier. And as God begins to lead him to write, he's going to take that illustration, the idea of the equipment of a Roman soldier, and apply it to the Christian life. So let's talk about the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. And I know this is a lot. Um, you know, I, I've done whole series on this. Uh, but I just want to give you an overview, all right? So let's quickly talk about this. All right, the first thing is put on the belt of truth. Put on the belt of truth. Ephesians 6, 14a says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. 
So the first thing he mentions is girding your waist with truth. So if we're going to be victorious and be faithful, we have to be people of truth. And this is talking about the truth is Jesus. The, the main thing to start with is Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the what? You know it, perhaps, the truth and the life. Jesus is the truth. We have to have our lives in Christ. That, that, what that simply means is we have to know Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. That, that's the first thing you put on. You put on Jesus. But that's not all. Number two, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Ephesians 6, 14b, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So on the breast, okay, that, and, and that's like the heart, right? That's, you know, that's protecting the, the heart. And, and what is that? Righteousness is obedience to God. Obedience to God. Make sure your heart is committed to God. Make sure you have on the breastplate of righteousness that your heart is given over to God and you protect your heart. In, in spiritual warfare, you have to protect your heart. The Bible says out of the heart flow the issues of life and we have to protect our hearts from so much worldliness around us. The third thing is put on the gospel of peace. Put on the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6, 15, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So the Bible talks about peace in uh, a couple of different ways. And what this is referring to is peace with God. Peace here is peace with God, which comes through salvation. So the Bible talks about the peace of God, and that has to do with like circumstances and and uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7 talks about, you know, pray to God and you'll have the peace of God. And that's peace that God gives you in the midst of, of your circumstances. But this is talking about having peace with God. And what that's talking about is realize that, that you know, in Jesus, we're no longer at war with God, that we're friends with God and we're saved. We're, we're his uh, children. And, and, and put that gospel of peace. And notice it says, uh, put it uh, on your feet. And part of what that means is you take that gospel uh, of peace and you not only apply it to your own life, but you share it with others. You tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, those that have beautiful feet are people that share the good news of Jesus with others. That's part of our armor that we have the gospel of peace and we're, 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 we know that we're at peace with God and we're telling everyone we can about salvation through Jesus. And then put on the shield of faith, the shield of faith. Oh, wow, how important is this? It says, above all, wow, that makes a priority, doesn't it? Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You see, we have that, that shield. And when the enemy throws those darts against us, we have that shield to protect us. And, 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 and what is faith? Faith is confident obedience to the word of God, regardless of circumstances or consequences. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith is confident obedience. So you, that you take that shield of faith, and you obey God, and you do it no matter what the circumstances are. You do it not only what the consequences are. Faith, faith is confident obedience to the Word of God, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the consequences. And, and when you have that shield in your life, you, you can protect yourself against the enemy. And then the next one, put on the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Ephesians 6, 17a says, and take the helmet of salvation. So now we're talking about the helmet of salvation, the helmet of salvation. And salvation is used here as this, total deliverance. 
Salvation is total deliverance. What, what does that mean? There, there are three different aspects of salvation. There's salvation from the penalty of sin, and that means when you accept Jesus, you're saved from the penalty of sin, which is hell, and then God can help us to be saved from the power of sin. God can give us salvation over sin, and then one day we'll have salvation from the very, listen, very presence of sin. We'll be in heaven in a perfect place. What it's talking about is realize, hey, you have total deliverance, past, present, future. You're saved past, you're saved present, and one day you'll be saved in the future. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on the belt of truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the gospel of peace. Put on the shield of faith. Put on the helmet of salvation. But there's one more. There's one more. And I chose to make this final one its own separate point in the sermon. And that is study and memorize the Bible. I just feel like this has to have emphasis and the reason I want to emphasize it is the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 17, B, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And, and, I, and I made this final piece of equipment that the Roman soldier would have would be a sword, a sword. And I want to emphasize the sword and I want to say this, study and memorize the Bible because the Bible says the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And the reason I want to make this its own point is because it's the only offensive weapon. All the other equipment that the Roman soldier would wear was primarily for defense, protection. The sword, on the other hand, is for offense. We have the sword of the Spirit. And, and, and what does that mean? It means that we study the Bible. And listen, it means we memorize the Bible. When it comes to spiritual warfare, the Bible, listen, it's a, it's a sword. It, 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 it's, a, it, it's a sword that we have to fight with. And, and I love the way the psalmist said it. Psalm 119, 11, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Listen, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. What, what does that mean? What, what, what is that talking about? What it's saying is when you have God's word in your life and you, and you hide it in your heart, when the enemy comes to tempt you to sin, what you do is you give out the word. You quote the word. You, the, 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 you protect yourself with the word. You go on offense with your sword. And, and, and listen, if you have an area of temptation, and we all do, we all do, and uh, you know what you need to do? You need to memorize scriptures related to that temptation. And when the enemy comes against you, you need to know them and even bet, better quote them. Quote them. When you're tempted to sin and do wrong, take your Bible and apply it to that situation and take your sword and attack Satan as he comes against you Again, the psalmist, 119.11, your word I've hidden in my heart. Why? Why? That I might not sin against you. Listen, the Bible says my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. And a lot of the reason we're not faithful, we're not consistent in our Christian life, is we're ignorant of the Bible. I urge you, become what I call a self-feeder. Feed yourself God's word every single day. Day. In our church, we have what's called the growth guide. Use your growth guide to get into God's word each and every day. And then number five, pray always. Pray always. Now, this one kind of ties back in to where we started. And where we started was to realize you're not going to live a faithful Christian life on your own strength. And our first point today was to rely on God's strength, not your own. And one way you express that is through prayer, through prayer. And Paul put it this way, Ephesians 6, 18 through 20, praying always, praying always 
We need to be in connection with God, talking with God always. That doesn't mean that, you know, we have to, you know, get alone or we have to get on our knees or whatever. We have to be in a church. No, you can talk to God anywhere and everywhere. I mean, I mean, just be in constant communion with God as you go through your life, as you, as you do the duties you have and responsibilities you have in, in life. Be, be mindful of God, asking God to help you, asking God uh, to strengthen you. Uh, again, praying always, praying always. In Luke 18, 1, Jesus said, Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. I love what Jesus said there. Don't lose heart. In our context today, don't be unfaithful. Don't lose your heart of faithfulness towards God. And again, pray always. Ask God to help you. And then lastly, build community for support. Build community for support. You see, the Apostle Paul realized the importance of having a network of people to help him. And support him. In uh, Ephesians 6, 21, he mentions one in particular. He says, but that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing. He says, Tychicus, and listen how he describes this, this uh, man, Tychicus, a beloved brother and a faithful minister in the Lord will make all things known to you. Listen, we need to have people like Tychicus in our lives. We, you're never going to be a faithful Christian. You, you're never going to win the battle when it comes to faithfulness trying to do it by yourself. Listen, Satan wants to isolate you. Satan wants to separate you because he knows, he knows if he can separate you and isolate you, he, you're weakened. You're weakened. There's power in numbers. There's power in, in, in team. And, 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 and you need to build community for support. Listen, you need to find, it doesn't have to be a lot of people, okay? You're not, you don't have to know hundreds of people. You can just have a trusted friend or, or two or three trusted friends or whatever, that you build that community with them. You build that support uh, together. Do that. Do that. In our church, we have what call, what's called growth groups. Uh, these are groups where you can sit down, with people like yourself, you can do it on site, you can do it online, and build relationships with people. And, and we have counseling workshops where you can gather with people. We have, we have a, a ministry called Losing to Live, which is totally team-based to help people uh, find strength and support to live a healthy lifestyle. All, all these things apply to what I'm saying today. You, and this is why we need the church. This is why we need God's church to help us uh, build these relationships. So listen, build your community by practicing what the Bible calls the one another commandments. Do you know that the Bible time and time again talks about one another, one another? And what it's talking about is we have specific responsibilities towards each other. And God has designed, God's given us a design for building community, and it's by practicing the one another. It's like love one another, pray for one another, forgive one another, you know, encourage uh, one another, be devoted uh, to one uh, another. I mean, I believe there's uh, well over 80 of them uh, in uh, the Bible. Hey, are you being faithful to God today? It's a battle. It is a, it is a fight that we're in. But let me tell you something. If you don't win that battle, it's going to greatly, greatly impact your potential in life. So fight. Fight for your faithfulness. Rely on God's strength, not your own. Know your enemy is the devil. Put on the armor of God, the whole armor of God. Study and memorize the Bible. Pray always. Build community for support. Fight for your faithfulness. And with that in mind, as we end today, I want us to have communion together. And I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 26, the first communion, and I'm going to follow the exact words and the exact way that Jesus did it, okay? 
in uh, Matthew chapter 26. So right now, you would take out your communion supplies, uh, whatever you're able to have there, and let's go before the Lord uh, with communion. So as we do this, the Bible says we do it in remembrance of Jesus. It reminds us of Jesus. It reminds us of his death for us, his sacrifice for us. And as we partake of the bread, the bread reminds us of the body of Jesus. And then the juice of the, of the cup reminds us of the blood of Jesus. So as we partake of that, let's remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Aren't you glad that Jesus was faithful to us? He was faithful to us. And let's be faithful to him. The Bible says in Matthew 26, 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread. So right now I want to take the bread, and again, the bread represents the uh, body of Jesus. And we think about the body of Jesus, always remember two things. One, the physical, physical pain that Jesus endured. I mean, he was beaten, he was scourged, he was, you know, crown of thorns in his head, spear in his side, he was crucified, he was nailed to a cross. But also in his body, he bore our sin. So there was a spiritual aspect to his pain. And he took the bread, he blessed it. Let's bless the bread. Father, we thank you for this bread and what it represents. Thank you for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. He broke it, he gave it to the disciples, and Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. Praise God. Then he took the cup. And as I said earlier, the cup reminds us of the blood of Jesus. And he gave thanks. Let's give thanks for the blood of Jesus. Lord, thank you for the precious blood of Jesus that washes us white as snow. Thank you for that blood that was shed for our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. He gave it to them. He gave it to them. And here's what he said. He said, drink from it. Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's partake of the cup right now. Hallelujah. Amen. That's, that's my word every time I finish communion. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hey, folks, we're in a fight, but like the Apostle Paul, let's make it a good fight.